Joining today's podcast is Mac Jenkins, former Reds Major League pitching coach who's earned two World Series rings in the 1990 with the Reds and the 2019 with the Nationals. Uh, welcome, Mac. I'm thrilled to have you on the show. Well, man, I appreciate you inviting me on. I'm uh, excited to talk with you. Well, I, you know, we ran into each other through, I think, Emo, and he thinks really highly of you, and uh, I know everyone thinks highly of him, too. Yeah, Emo is a great guy. He's a very good pitching coach. I enjoy being around him. I wanted to talk to you about uh, command, control, and sequencing. Well, you know, when you talk about uh, command and control, to me, those are two different things. Yes. And I think the easiest way to describe it is if you drew a box and you just had 15 dots, and a lot of them were in the middle of the box, and just sprayed around sporadically. So that would be control because he's throwing pitches that are inside this imaginary box, strike zone. Yeah. But demand would be you would see those same 15 dots, some down and away, some up and in, bottom of the strike zone. And so I think that's the difference. I think you can measure, hey, this guy is a strike thrower by you know uh, his walks per nine. You can look at that. But if the guy the pitcher is throwing all those pitches in the heart of the plate. I mean, he's probably backing up third base a lot. <laughs> so, I mean, that differentiates uh, control and command, you know, strike thrower uh, versus someone who can actually, you know, locate the ball within the strike zone. And guys who have command are able to throw balls uh, out of the strike zone uh, when they want to. They have you chase their their pitch. Yeah, I'm glad you said that because a lot of people haven't mentioned that. And I always thought that command was uh, being able to throw the ball where you want to throw it, in or out of the zone, you know? Oh, no question. I mean, I mean, to me as a pitcher, I have to be able to throw the ball between the home plate and the batter, you know? I have to be able to, to pitch inside without hitting him. I don't want to hit him. I want to keep my side of the plate, which is generally going to be the outside part of the plate. And, you know, being the, having the confidence to do that. And, you know, uh, pitching could be debated for, for days and especially in today's with, you know, uh, social media, but it, it all bo will boil down to is, can you get ahead in the count and make the hitter swing at your pitch? Mm -hmm. And if you look at, uh, I mean, the best pitchers of any era, you know, a lot of those pitches are out of the strike zone, but they got there because they were, you know, ahead in the count, they had two strikes. They were 0-2. They were 1-2. And, you know, the, uh, today we see a lot of elevated pitches. Of, you know, the hitter chased the ball out of the strike zone up because that's what I am do, but I have to get ahead in the count. So, Right, or like walking a guy along the, the, the zone if he's chasing after your slider and you keep him going out, you know, that kind yeah. of thing. And I think that's like a command issue if you're going another two inches each time, you know. Yeah, and I think that's when uh, young pitchers go from uh, the minor leagues to the major leagues. They find out that, you know, they they miss the zone by too much for the hitter to swing at, mm -hmm. or they're throwing the ball in the heart of the plate. Yeah. And that's uh, sometimes you outstuff guys, you know, when you're in the, in the minor leagues. And it's just it's just rare that you outstuff guys. And even guys with the best pitches we see in the major leagues, they're not ERAs of zero. Somebody's hitting them. You yeah. know, uh, so, you know, it's just learning to, you know, stay within yourself. But, you know, before command comes control, you have to be able yeah. to fill that strike zone up. Yeah. And that's to me, that's like, you know, I'm going to I have an imaginary box. That's my strike zone. Let's just fill that strike zone with as many pitches. We got 30 today. Let's we'll see how many we can get in that box. Then when we get really good at it, we're going to divide that box in half. Yeah, you know, it might be upper half and lower half, or inner half and outer half, and then thirds, even. and then thirds. Yeah, then I'll start to, you know, I'll get those buffer pitches that are. We see some umpires call them strikes. We see some not, but you know, if we've gotten those first two in the zone, a lot of times we see hitters chase those fringy pitches with two strikes, and that's what we. That's up another part of command. I'm going to throw you a curveball with two strikes. Well. You know, if I throw it 48 feet, I threw it in the dirt, but I didn't throw a competitive pitch. So they're that's a good, a that's commanding a good the ball out of the zone. So I made you want to swing at the pitch. I enticed you. 
Right. That's like in a, that pitch grader software. I have a stat for competitive pitches. So oh, that's, you that's... Own, yeah, it was own percent, but also competitive pitch, uh, pitch percent. Uh, because like you said, I've noticed that, uh, especially when you go to double A, uh, that's where the more selective the batters are being. Like in the lower levels, they kind of swing at everything. They don't really ever approach all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, double A, and then of course, triple A and, and major league, the batters are selective. So you can't be far out of the zone unless you have great movement that it, it, it breaks so late that they think it's going to be in the zone, you know? That's right. You know, I think that's where it separates guys who are just really throwing hard versus guys who are really pitching. And, you know. Yeah, man. They, I mean, on the back of your baseball card is still, uh, even in today's age of, you know, hard throwers and higher velocity, it says left-handed pitcher, not left-handed thrower. You yeah. Know? So there's a big difference between being a pitcher and a thrower. Oh, and those yeah. guys that are throwers, man, they honestly, they fall, they fall by the wayside. Yeah. Gil Patterson's in the same guys throw 96, 97, 98, get released all the time. And guys, there are guys that are 91 are still pitching. It's like at some point you have to pitch. Uh, the higher velo really helps, but you still have to pitch, you know? Yeah. I mean, you have to be usable. Uh, I know when you're in Cincinnati, we had, I'm not going to use his name, but, you know, we had this pitcher. Uh, I had never seen him. We didn't see him in major league camp, uh, but he's going to come to the major leagues. He's 95 to hundred. Mm-hmm. You know, he's got 2,500 RPMs. He's got a 3000 RPM breaking ball and you get there and he's not usable because yeah. he's two Oh and three one on everybody. And he's very slow to the plate. Oh. And every time someone gets on, he steals, you know, uh, you know, it's not always expecting a finished product when you arrive in the major leagues, but you expect to have mastered this part of the craft to get there. Otherwise, I mean, when do I pitch you? You know, just yeah. when we're, you know, losing by 12 or winning by 12. And those days are, those days are rare. Yeah. Well, like Emo calls it useful velocity. Yeah. Like, hey, yeah. You're, throwing, you're throwing 98, but well, how can you pitch with, you know, uh, I think, uh, part of the reason I wanted to start the podcast was to, uh, of course, promote the target I'm selling, but also that too many people talk only about velocity, know that velocity alone will not get you anywhere. Uh, there's a lot more to being a successful pitcher in the minors and in the majors. You know, What do you think uh, the role is in mechanics playing command? Meaning, I, I've always made an analogy of... Uh, uh, trying to shoot from a rocking boat and that if you could, if you timed the movements just right, you could do that. But if you had a good repeatable mechanics, it would be more like standing on solid ground and you would have better chances of having command. How do you view mechanics? And so, yeah, uh, it's a great question. And um, I think that you're looking for your pitcher to have the most efficient throwing mechanics possible and uh, you don't want to to teach that you know things do help in today's game uh, that are available whether they're edutronic cameras that are can break it down for you but you know using motion capture uh, helps a lot you know biomechanic analysis but you know the 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 pitching mechanics we do want to have them repeatable and I think we know that being perfect is not attainable, but we want to avoid is that big misses in, uh, you know, especially like your arm slot. And, you know, I think, Wayne, that comes from uh, you're teaching something that's controllable effort. And a lot of times, so the, the physical, the pitching mechanics goes right or wrong with the mental approach because yeah. so many young players uh, get ahead in the count and they're going to try to do too much, you know, and now they've gone from 0-2 to 3-2 and the, the advantage is back to the hitter. Mm-hmm. And the same thing, like, I mean, I saw it in the major leagues, I think in 2017, uh, the Cincinnati Reds set a record for most games started by rookies. And the whole season was get behind in the count, overthrow your fastball and give up damage hits and walks. 
you know, walks or homers are bad formula. Uh, so, you know, you, you do want to get a good delivery that allows you to command two more pitches on a downhill plane. And some of that, you know, comes into the thought process as well. So I think it's a combination of, of both of those that allows guys to be good strike throwers. Johnny Cueto was always a great strike thrower. When he came from the Dominican Republic, he was a good strike thrower. And then as he evolved as a pitcher, you know, he started, you talk about sequencing, you know, he started throwing arm side cutters followed by arm side sinkers. It, they look like the same pitch, you know, and then on the same thing, change up on that side of the plate. So a different movement profile, different speed. Uh, but first he did have good command and, you know, his deliver, delivery evolved. And I think we see a lot of players, their deliveries evolve uh, as they get into pro ball, they get, they get bigger through uh, weight training uh, and they have to make tweaks in their delivery because they have more muscle mass. They gain weight because they just physically mature like all of us uh, do at, the, at those ages. So a good delivery is important for command of the ball. It's, it's a good, it's important for your health and guys being available. You know, a pitcher, you know, has two good starts and his arm is sore. He, he, is a bullpen. He's unavailable today because I could simplify it as much as walking. You know, we all walk with a certain gait and now it could be something physical, you know, something yeah. nagging. And now you walk a little differently. And so the, the health uh, goes into there as well. You know, is the pitcher healthy? He has the right mindset, you know, and he does, he have this delivery that he can control his body movements. Right, because then to me it was always about if the command, if the uh, mechanics are the same, they're repeatable. Then when he's throwing, he's not thinking about his mechanics because it's ingrained. He's just doing them the same way over and over. And now I have always thought that's freeing his mind to focus on what he really needs to do is that the pitch he's about to throw. You know. Oh, well, there's no question. I think once the game start, whether you're a pitcher or a hitter, it's about competing. Yeah. You know, if you're a pitcher, it's about executing one pitch after the other. Uh, if you're in tune with your your pitching delivery, uh, you know that, man, if I keep missing up an arm side, I'm flying open. Right. You have right. If I'm going in, I'm going to miss in. I don't want to miss in the heart of the plate. Yeah, it's exactly. like I'm trying to elevate a fastball. I don't want to miss mid-thigh high. I right. want to miss high. Yeah. I saw uh, an interview with Pedro Martinez once that stuck with me. And he was talking about his pitching coach telling him to execute his idea so that if you're going to miss, miss far, oh, you know, like execute your idea, you know? Yeah. That's a great way to think about it. And different, I think different pitchers, you know, they give different cues, different mental cues stick with them. Yeah. And something may be that they learned, you know, when they were 18, that sticks with them when they're pitching in a major league all-star game or in the playoffs. Yeah. Uh, what kind of mental training have you recommended for uh, your pitchers? I know everyone talks about Dorfman, which is great. Like right. I, I mean, Dorfman helped uh, Maddox as well as uh, Doc Holliday. I, I learned yesterday he also helped Doc Holliday in his transition. Well, Ken Revisa is also uh, a great uh, sports psychologist. Uh, he He recently has passed away, but he was the most phenomenal guy I'd ever been around and the way he related to players and talked about the mental side of competing. Uh, but I, I think for, for pitchers and, uh, you know, mental training, I mean, I'm a big believer in having routines. Routines kind of get you locked in mentally. Uh, and it could be a pregame routine if you're a starting pitcher uh, Clayton Kershaw just recently talked about his, you know, and it's like at 642 is when he starts playing catch. Mm -hmm. And they show some videos of him looking at the clock at 640 and he's not going to start throwing yet. You know, and this is the number of throws I make. And then I go to the bullpen uh, and I want to, you know, he finishes before the anthem. Mm -hmm. uh, but I've known Wayne, a lot of pitchers who, I talked about Cueto, you know, he wanted to throw X number of pitches before every game. 
uh, Michael Leake threw, uh, I think it was 42 pitches. And at the 42nd pitch bounce, it didn't matter. That like that was his routine. It got him locked in. So and what, I think, would Qua- what would Cueto do, let's say, for a pregame uh, routine? Like, like walk us through that because he's a great pitcher as well. Uh, so he's a uh, like assisted trainer stretch, uh, in the clubhouse, uh, some, uh, cardio to get warmed up, uh, medi ball to get loosened up. Uh, and then he would go out and he long tossed, uh, with the bullpen catcher and he would throw up to 250 feet. Mm-hmm. Uh, then he did a, a short flat ground, right. uh, before he went to the bullpen mound, uh, he was a guy who would, so the anthem time was really important. It's at different times at different stadiums. So that was one thing you would always talk about with your pitcher, uh, seven ten start, you know, seven Oh one anthem, you know, whether you're home or road. And when you go to St. Louis, they do anthem and God bless America. Mm-hmm. You know, this is before the meeting at home plate, the, before the opposing pitcher has taken the mound. So you still have some time after God Bless America, but it's a bigger pause in there. So guys would have to adjust their routine. Uh, so I'll get back to Johnny. So, you know, he worked from the windup to stretch. He would maybe work a couple hitters, but he, uh, I would count the pitches that he would throw in the bullpen. He always wanted to know how many, how many he had thrown and it might be 42. And he, he then he would kind of go rapid fire because, you know, he wanted to be done seven minutes before so he could walk in towel off get some water uh before he took them out what what he, areas he, of the plate would he throw to typically for his warm-ups would it be the same or different uh the same kind of get the feel of the slope which you're just trying to work in the middle part of the plate mm-hmm. uh and then move the catcher to the pitcher's glove side mm-hmm. and then hit on the arm side which is where he threw a high percent of his pitches at that time uh you know, his sinker was so good over there, you could know it's coming and still hit it on the ground. Yeah. And the same with the change up. So if he could get the arm side of the plate locked in with sinker, front door cutter, change up, it was going to be a good night. Mm-hmm. And then he could still throw the cutter up and into lefties. The thing is, those weren't usually strikes when we talk about command, but man, they sure look like strikes, you know? Well, yeah. As, that's, as you that's have to make a swing decision, that pitch looked like a strike. Yeah. And, you know, I know you you had mentioned uh, the sequencing, you know, how about a cutter that runs in on you if you're a left-handed batter and the next one is a front hip two-seamer that comes back to the plate. And if you yeah. execute those pitches, the pitcher really has to make a mistake for you to find the barrel. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I was talking about like, uh, uh, like with a sinker using a cutter to get people off your sinker. And if you have a slider uh, using a cutter there to also – keep a guy on it's from chasing after hunting your slider uh and to, to do that you kind of have to come have command because you have to kind of tunnel them the same in the first like 20 or 30 feet so that right. batter doesn't really know which is coming yeah i mean uh i think the the term you know tunneling or sequencing is a it's a newer yeah. phrase yeah, I, I use tunneling, but in my yeah. first book, I kind of railed against it, and I was saying it's really funneling. Okay, it's I remember me, reading it. Yeah, because to me, a tunnel is a straight line. It's like, well, oh, we, that's, what, that's what I used to tell the guys from the front office, and they didn't like it. I'd say we're not going to use that. <laughs> yeah, I didn't like that because I don't want everything the same, like it's coming through a shoot, and the batter just goes, hits right from that shoot. I'm, I'm thinking it's the middle of the plate, and the guy doesn't know which direction it's going. I mean that to me, Wayne. That's the best. The best pitchers is that you can start pitches off in the heart of the plate, and you know they go left, right. Uh, some go, might go straight down like a curve. Some might go down and away like a slider. And so, and if you're a hitter, you're always wanting to swing at those pitches because when it leaves the hand and you have so little time to make a decision, well, those pitches are in the middle of the plate as you're making a decision. Yeah, and, and then they move. Right. And if you're known for uh, control, meaning you, they know you're throwing strikes, when you can command it that way, they're going to swing because they know they can't sit and take it. It's going to be a strike. So either you get either getting foul balls or you're getting strikes. 
Yeah, I think that goes for the hitters. They know the reputation, but the home plate umpire also knows the reputation. <laughs> and all of a sudden, that 17 inches is now 19 inches, or maybe it's 20 inches, just because you're anticipating this guy throwing a ton of strikes. Yeah, but uh, recently, like my son in AAA, uh, I think he had the first uh, challenge to a pitch in AAA, and he's known as a strike thrower. And he threw it, it's on a black, and he, they challenged it, and he won the challenge. So, like, the robo zone is kind of overruling some of that umpire's wiggle room, you know? I don't know, man. Did you check out some of those strike zones last night in the major leagues? No, I didn't. I didn't last night. <sighs> you know? They're, they're very generous. <laughs> well, I, as a pitcher, you like that, you know? But sometimes, yeah, it's it's, sometimes like, uh, I know – a pitcher who throws a lot of sinkers or sliders, if the umps are stingy at the bottom of the zone, that challenge is really helpful because the umpires aren't getting it. There really are strikes, you know? So the, uh, the pitcher can challenge as well, or just the hitter? The, the pitcher, I mean the pitcher or the batter. Oh, that's, that's interesting. And you get, I think it's two challenges. I don't know what it is this year, uh, but it was last year. I think it was two challenges. And if you if your challenge is upheld, you still keep your two talent challenges. So what a yeah. concept. Yeah, I, I thought it was pretty good because uh I don't know if you read that art article I wrote with the uh, baseball perspectives called uh the Robo Zone. Okay. Uh and and it anyway, uh and we were talking about in that article about the dangers of a robo zone and and uh for cheating with software like people can use computers and can cheat if you have a computer calling strikes and balls so we wrote an article to kind of expose some of the things to watch out for and in that uh i kind of defined what i would call a universal strike zone um which was if a computer is going to call balls and strikes i figured it ought to have a a, a zone that is on the same page with everybody, the batter, the umpire, the pitcher, all the same for everybody. Uh, a lot of people don't like that, but uh, I took army data and analyzed thousands of different uh, men and where their hips are, where their shoulders are, where everything is, and figured what was a typical zone for a six foot two batter. And that's what I made my target zone. So if you put, set my target up, it's a zone for a six foot two batter. And if you practice that, uh, you see it while you're throwing to it. And then when you go in a game, you're used to that zone. It kind of helps you with this problem we were just talking about where the umpires are squeezing you or not squeezing you. Because mm -hmm. I think a lot of times pitchers, uh, I talked about this yesterday, when they're training for command or control, they're having a catcher catch. And they're making the pitcher and the catcher determine where they think this part is in the zone or out of the zone. So you're, are you measuring their ability to throw a strike or their ability to guess where a strike is and then throw to where they guessed it was? The target that we're selling, uh, it gives them a better visualization of where a strike zone really is as opposed to just where a catcher's mid is, which may or may not be in the zone, you know? Yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah, that's good. I know we used your, uh, at the Pro 5 Baseball Academy, we used your universal strike zone. Yeah. When we had some winter workouts to set up uh, strings. Yeah. Uh, that were, you know, 40 inches at the top and the width and the bottom of the zone. But man, I found it was so educational for the catchers. Mm -hmm. I really did. And it was like, man, I didn't, you know, think that this was the bottom of the zone or top of the zone with my mitt. And it was so educational for the, it was, it was a good visual for the pitchers too. And, uh, you know, if you're going to, I think as coaches, if we're going to, we have to, if it's important, I think you have to measure it. It's like, how am I going to measure Absolutely. this guy's command? You can't improve uh, something you can't measure, right? Right. So, I mean, I do like, uh, you know, we actually will have guys manually chart 
because we don't have your device yet. Yet, see. Uh, and so we can see. And sometimes, you know, we'll run like a scripted bullpen. So this is what we're going to do. Go ahead and get loose. Yeah, I got that in the target, too. You can define oh. your own scripts. and I, I, I love that, man. It's a great idea. And it's like a scripted bullpen. We talk about the mental side. That and To me, that helps you, too. Mm -hmm. That helps you lock in. So this is, this is what we're going to do. And, uh, you know, I'm going to remind you as we go, but this is the format today. These are the next 12 pitches. Uh, it's also good for onboarding when you bring a pitcher in you know certain stages uh -huh. and you can have it have them all test with a certain script so you can measure where all these pitchers are in regards to each other in terms of command and control the good misses and i really do like uh measuring because you know Sometimes the word good is so like in baseball, we throw it around. How was your bullpen today, Wayne? Oh, I thought it was pretty good. Yeah, well, meanwhile, you, threw, it, we, meanwhile. You, threw, you threw three out of 25 pitches in the zone. So yeah, yeah. we're going to call that a low average today. All right. Because yeah. next time you come out, you're going to get the same number. Let's see if we can't get a minimum of half of those yeah. in the strike zone. That's now your, your focus. And we talk about in the game of mental toughness. Part of it is being able to focus, right? Absolutely. Storm under pressure. Well, here's your pressure because you're competing because the next guy's going to come in and we're going to, you know, we're having a contest. Yeah. And you have thousands of people and they're screaming and cheering and all that. You got to block yeah. that out and zero in on the only thing that's important in life at that moment, which is the next pitch, you know? So I I, uh, I saw the video you have on uh, the tracker, right? So I yeah. was thinking, man, if I had some young kids, I would play tic tac toe with those kids. I would I would yeah. be their competitor. Yeah, and we would. We and you know, it just it just increases the focus level. Uh, and then when you get good at it, you start doing it with something beside a fastball. Yeah, what I you did know. was last weekend I took it out uh, to another coach friend, and he had. Uh, two groups of 20 pitchers, high school guys. Okay. And I put it in a multiplayer mode so that every pitcher throws one pitch and the next guy goes, the next guy. Okay. I found something really interesting that when I did it that way, most of them barely hit the target. All right. Then we had it for two pitches per player. Second pitch, they start hitting the target. It's and you know it's they had a mental block at first throwing to the target, and then the second time, and then we did another round later where they had three or four pitches. The more they threw to the target, the better they got at it, and the more accurate they got. It was like I don't know. It's kind of like um, I don't know how to describe it. It's just, at first yeah. they're missing it all over, and then when they realize they they can't throw as accurate as they thought they did. They start really trying and focus. Then they start hitting their spots, you know? You know, I uh, Homer Bailey used to always say, man, he goes, we we are professional target hitters. Mm -hmm. That's what you are as a pitcher, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. We're professional target hitters. No matter what the situation, the count, you know, I'm trying to hit the target. And he was a person who was very visual. I mean, he wanted the mitt in a certain place. And, you know, there's other pitchers. Of the same caliber would say, you know, I don't, I don't use the mid a lot. I might throw to the shin guards, or if I'm trying to break, uh, bounce the breaking ball, I look at his feet, mm -hmm. you know. So, but he was a guy who wanted the visual, and he thought of being, you know, a, a professional target hitter, you know, when he was a bow hunter and a, a sportsman, and that's what he, that's how he related, and you know, it's a guy with went started his career with. You know, below average command and control, and by the end, you know, he was good. Yeah. The other cool thing I found, too, was uh, the target has created a universal language. Meaning, when you look at my target, you got numbers in the zone, you got letters right. on, the, on the shadow zone, and then after guys are using it for a while, coaches and pitchers, even batters, I could tell them I want you to throw a slider at number seven or a cutter at 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 letter B, and they automatically know where that is. And it was okay. not given a, a blob like in a a heat map and throw it here. It's like 
they know from, I give them a letter or number, they know exactly where that is in a zone or right out of the zone. And having a language, you know, as a coach, at, when you want to coach a player, I, I know working with my son and some others, uh, one of the most difficult things was making sure that we have the same language, that we're speaking the same things. Like I might say one thing, but they they interpret it a different way, you know? Man, that's something that's uh, everywhere in life. People <laughs> interpret things a, diff a different way than what your intention is, what I'm saying. And Yeah. Uh, you know, that's a great, uh, great idea. So if the kids recognize, like, like you said, I want you to throw this curveball to A. So it's under the strike zone, in the shadow zone. Mm -hmm. I wonder if uh, if they could use the pitch con the same way. Well, yeah, because after you get into a game, you already know where that is. Yeah. It's like you practice to, the, to that zone. It's kind of ingrained. It's like uh, That's a valuable tool, those guys practicing, hitting those. Uh, and then, like, memorizing, if you just say four and say the pitch type, that they know exactly where they're going. Yeah, they know where it is, you know. Uh, one of the other things I wanted to ask you I thought was really important is um, uh, I have a list of things that uh, I kind of think are important for a pitcher. Um, I don't uh, include control in the list because I don't think you're a pitcher if you don't have control. Okay. <laughs> uh, but I want to know what you think is important, like, in, in – this list. Uh, number one is character. Number two is command. Number two is changing speeds, movement, max velocity, sequencing, reading batters, and mental toughness. Which kind of four are the ones that percolate to the top for you as a guy who would be a good pitcher if he has those? Well, I would say that he has command. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's command of two or more pitches, two if you're a reliever, three or four if you're a starter. Yeah. Um, and then I think the ability to be mentally tough because you have to be resilient. Uh, you know, you have to be able to to drown the crowd out and just to move on, which I think a lot of young pitchers can't move on from a missed call from the umpire, a misplay by the outfielder. Uh, they just they can't get rid of that pitch. And I know Greg Maddox once said, the next pitch is the most important pitch of the game, and you have to get that mentality. Uh, you know, if there's a missed call or an error, just you get the ball back and you focus on executing pitches. And that is part of the mental toughness that you're able to overcome uh, that emotional anger or frustration and move to the next pitch where you're 100% committed to executing that pitch. Without distraction. Without Yeah, without distraction. I would probably say number three would be the ability to change speeds yeah. because hitting is all about timing. Right. So I'm the same way. Change speeds, it's another huge one for me. You know, and if a guy doesn't have a great changeup, well, if I had a fastball at 94 and a curve at 74, that's changing speeds. Yeah. You know, and I can elevate the fastball. And I could throw the curve, and the curve looks like the fastball out of the hand. Yeah. Uh, so but you have all, to. Yeah, but if you only throw a 95 mile an hour fastball, and you can't throw anything else for a strike, you're going to have a long day. <laughs> yeah, you'll be in the showers quickly, and you'll be backing up home and third a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you, like I said, you have to command two or more pitches. You know, and if I picked a fourth thing out of there, man. I would probably say movement and a pitcher to me with great movement. Like those, those guys are like, should, they should feel like they're never in trouble yeah. because my movement is so unpredictable. Yeah. You know, especially if I have pitches that move one moving to the glove side, one to the arm side, and I can throw everything towards the middle. Yeah. And uh, when you throw balls towards the middle and the hitter wants to swing and if you can end up on the end of the bat or on the thumbs, I've gotten soft contact. Yeah, I love me. I love a one pitch weak grounder, like 60 miles an hour to shortstop. Mm -hmm. Man, if three pitches and you're out of the inning, I'd love that. Yeah. You know, I figure if, you know, your job as a pitcher is to get outs, 
but I think also your job is to stay deep in the game and do that with as little pitches as you can, because that gives your cha- your team a chance to win. And to me, I always say the most important stat is winning the game. You know. Well, no question whether the pitcher is credited with the win or not. If you go and look at it's it's always win, a team. yeah it's that, always a team win. Yeah. The how many? What was the record in games you started? Uh, and that's important. And you know, I have a I have a pitcher uh, who I'm very close with, who's pitching with the Nationals now, and he's gone through a lot in his career. He finally got to the big leagues this year, and uh, we try to watch every game that he starts. We record it to watch it, and you know, one thing that is he has done that usually pitchers with his experience level don't do, don't do is he's been able to stay in games. You know, and it's a day and age where people don't look for a ton of pitches or innings. But when the Marlins have, or the Nationals have needed six innings, man, he has competed for six innings. And uh, they've had two walk-off wins that, you know, he was not the winning pitcher. But because a game that could have gotten away from him, you know, three runs after three innings, and he ends up going six and only giving up three, it gives the team a chance to win. Exactly. And that's yeah. that's important. And and it's a team win. And you're doing your part to help the team win by by using fewer pitches that allow you to stay in the game longer. You know? Yeah, and to do that, you gotta have command. You gotta have command. You have to have yeah. smart too. Because for example, you have to we talked about this the other day, which is uh you have to read batters, of course, and you 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 see their flinches, what they don't flinch at. You see what they're looking for, what they're hunting. And based upon that, you're going to make decisions of what to throw and where. And that's where command come in, comes in, because you to, in order to do that, you have to command, you know, what pitches are going to throw, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I think some some pitchers will or have a hard time, I'll say, reading the hitter, right? But they can always, you can always react to what you see. Yeah. And maybe we're saying the same thing. But if I face a right-handed batter and he takes my fastball over the first base dugout, he's late, mm-hmm. you know. And you see it so much with young pitchers. Oh, next pitch, strike slider. And the oh, guy hits it in the gap. 100%, 100% right. That I didn't I didn't say that, which is uh, where they foul off a ball is huge to me. That tells me yeah. a lot about what what's going on. Yeah, so the foul ball uh, will tell you if they're on time. Uh, and actually the flight of a foul ball, you know, a ball that tails away from a hitter lets me know that the barrel is dropping. Uh, but you, just how a hitter reacts, even if it's bad body language, because a pitch down and away is called a strike. Hmm. There's no way that was a strike. And I can tell by his body language that he doesn't think that's a strike. So obviously he doesn't like that pitch very much. Uh, and I'll probably go back to it at some time during that at bat. Yeah, I had a lot of discussion, some discussions with, uh, you know, Tim Hires. He was at the Oh, yeah. And we would kind of pick each other's brains, and I would ask him, well, you know, what are your batters looking for? And he described uh, J.D. Martinez, and he said he was hunting lanes. He would pick lanes, and he was only swinging at things if they're in his lane. So he had a good judgment and spatial awareness to know where the lane is. But the batter was picking out a lane and ignoring everything else. And so if I see a batter doing that, I kind of know how I have to tack him. Uh, if you're pitching to a guy, the GCL, they're swinging at anything they while they have no right. land. So I guess there are approaches to guys who have a plan at the plate and their approaches to guys that have no plan, but you kind of see them swinging at anything, you know? Yeah. And, you know, if you're, I mean, if you're a pitcher, I mean, you're also a baseball player. So I'm not pitching, but I'm watching because I'm pitching tomorrow. And I see that, uh, you know, the leadoff hitter and four at bats saw five pitches. Mm-hmm. You know, I would say, man, this guy's really aggressive. So I can't just go middle, middle of the plate to get strike one. So I'm pitching this guy. I mean, to me, I would simplify it. Pitch him like you have a strike on him already when you face this guy, if I was pitching coach. And that means when you're ahead in the count, pitches generally move away from the middle. 
And when the, you know, I think it's universal when the pitcher is behind the count, they throw the balls towards the middle uh, to, you know, so they don't walk people. But uh, you can definitely when you're pitching, you can react to what you see. And then as an observer, I can see, man, this guy's seen seven curveballs and swung and missed at every one of them. Yeah. You know? So I think if I get into uh, a spot tomorrow, he might see a few curveballs. I'll tell you this. So we're playing the Cubs in Chicago, and uh, we go over the pregame meeting. We have their lineup. And we always do mention the opposing pitcher, whether they can swing or, or if they can bunt at all. Mm-hmm. And I tell them, uh, this guy's right-handed pitcher, but hits left-handed. I said, in the past, he's really had trouble with breaking ball. The breaking balls, right? So he gets uh, in the third inning, this guy, the pitcher hits a home run on a chest high breaking ball. And the pitcher comes in and goes, I thought you said he couldn't hit a breaking ball. I said, not the chest high ones. Breaking balls like executed down in the zone and under the zone. Well, you know, also, so- that comes into play like is that sometimes. Uh, you make a good pitch in a good location and they get a hit. It's well tip the hat. I mean, it happens. That's, I mean, that happens. I mean, that's like, yeah. I mean, we just talked about get the ball back. Right. And mentally you just have to tell yourself, I made the right pitch in the right location. It just didn't work out, but you yeah. know, I mean, I saw Akuna hit a ball the other night that was, it was up in the zone a little bit, but on the that? edge of the plate at 95 and he hit it to dead center. Ooh. You know, yeah. when guys would come to the big leagues, man, and guys would get hits like that, you know, pretty good slider off the plate, line drive the other way for a hit. It happens. Like, w- w- welcome to the, block welcome to the big leagues, man. Yeah. Block These it guys out. are good. Yeah. These guys you're facing are good. And you just, I mean, at some point in your career, you realize the more pitches you execute, the, the more success you have. But every executed pitch doesn't result in an out. Yeah. You know, could be a swinging butt, could be a homer, base hit the other way. And just like you're going to throw some cookies down the middle that the hitter throws his back because he popped it up, you know, because it was such a fat pitch. Yeah. Uh, there's another thing that came up uh, last year uh, in pitch grader and, and partly with the second book, I defined pitches based upon a formula uh, formulas. And I did that because too often pitches are they have 10 fastballs, four curveballs, and three sliders. But it turns out that two of those fastballs really change ups. And then they put them in the same group of fastballs. So it skews the, the data on fastballs. And that's a problem when you're dealing with data on pitches is that if they're mixed and they weren't uh, called correctly, it messes up the data. So I was talking with Emo about that too. And I, he was saying, well, if the opposing team is talking about my guy who has a great slider and he doesn't have a great slider, he's throwing a, uh, or let's say a better a curveball, I'm not going to tell them, let them figure it out. Yeah. And, and it was like, wow, there's gamesmanship. I, and it brought back to the time when I first made Pritch Grader, there was a guy to a college was known for his slider. They had a great slider and he did really well and went and got drafted and everything else. But I wanted to know, well, what makes a great slider? So I was looking at the data and studying his slider. And the more I looked at it, the more I realized, well, I don't think that's a slider. I, I think I would call it a power curve because it's only moving down. It's it has no, it's higher speed, it's moving down, it's not has no uh glove side movement at all. And I thought, wow, everyone is swinging at this pitch. They know his slider is coming. And they're swinging at it like a slider, yet it's really kind of like a power curve. So that's why they're missing it all the time. And so I thought, well, that's why I wrote that second book, is that if you can uh, advance scout uh, pitchers and know what they really throw based upon the movement, not based upon what they called it, because you know as a pitching coach, the guy says, I throw a, a great sinker, and it really runs more than it sinks. It's not really a, a true sinker. You know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah. A, a pitcher takes a grip, and he throws the ball, and he calls it the pitch based upon what he gripped it at. But in reality, I 
I call a pitch based upon how it moved, not by how he called it, you know? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's, that's, uh, even, even here at the high school level, you know, the kids say, I throw a slider, I throw a cutter, and I just use our stuff to auto tag it based on the movement profile. <laughs> you know, if you want to, if it makes you feel good to call out a curve, that's fine. That's not a curve. But. Yeah. I'm just thinking like at the high D level. D oh, level yeah. And up oh, yeah. Well, and you would want it like, like if I look at the team we're playing and I get their report and the, their players who are tagging pitches put it as fastball and they're all come up as cutters like on auto tag. I'm like, that's what I write. Yeah. And this guy throws his fastballs. I'll have, you know, three or four inches of horizontal cut on them to him. Yeah. Yeah. So for advanced scouting, it's huge. I think there's that gainsmanship that is slowly getting weeded out because I'm noticing more and more that even on the, the major league broadcast, they're broadcasting what the pitch was based upon how they're figuring it out. Uh, I don't no, know, no, man. You you call it, you coin the sweeper, and there it is. Yeah. I, well, I didn't I didn't call it that. I think I called it a. Uh, uh, well, I called it a, a slider, and then the, I took the data from Mariona Rivera's uh, slider. I mean cutter, and I called that a. Uh, what do they call that? The shredder. A, a shredder. Yeah. Shredder. Basically, I. Uh, um, that's the other thing. When I see people talk about stuff, they'll take a slider, and if it's at the extreme ends of what a slider is, uh, they'll call it a good slider. But the extreme end of a slider can be the low end of a cutter. For example, if right. someone throws a slider really hard, right, uh, they'll wind up with a poor cutter. You know, especially if they're gripping it like a slider, you know? Right. So I think some of those characterizations, whether you're tagging a pitch, uh, if it's incorrect, you can have gainsmanship in terms of uh, how the opposing batters can scout you. And then in terms of categorizing stuff for a pitch, it can also be gainsmanship because you can have a bad, like I said, you could have a bad cutter or extreme slider, right? Right. Which which do you pick? You could say, oh, he's got a bad cutter, or you could say hey, he's got a great slider. <laughs> yeah, you're just trying to uh, give some type of good description for your hitters. Yeah, so that's why I wrote the second book because I wanted to kind of cut through that nonsense because, uh, like, like you can you know appreciate as a pitching coach, uh, you just want to know well what is he throwing and how is it moving and what is it. I mean, we, we use all that all that stuff to like. You're talking about giving guys that want to funnel or tunnel. I mean, you take their fastball and you try to pair it with the type of second pitch that would work best, you know? Absolutely. Does a curve work best, a slider? Is it a cutter? What What's going to work best? Because it's hard to change the profile of your fastball. Yeah. Uh, now, how do you do it? Because what I did in the second book was to uh, – I, I looked at what made uh, – I looked at great pitchers, and when they mm -hmm. got later in their careers, uh, their velo went way down, but they still had great results, and I wondered why. So when I put their pitches through uh, the, the formulas, what I noticed was really clear was that each of their pitches were different enough from each other. Like if you looked at a, uh, uh, a, a chart, and you had cutters here, and you had sliders here. They they were all different enough from each other. Except, uh, you can't just look at it in, in a two D chart. I looked at a three D graph. Okay. So I, I put some pictures in there of the three D. So I was looking at a three D chart of their pitches, and if they were different enough from each other, that that's when they, they had great success. And what I noticed was that. Even if they missed their spot, they were still getting good results because the pitches were different enough from each other, meaning their cutter was much more different than their slider, which was much more different than their sinker. Uh, so how do you assemble a repertoire like that? Uh, well, 
first look at the fastball, right? I want to look at the the spin, uh, the velocity, and the like current movement that he has, movement profile. But uh, I think when they when the players are old enough, man, I think there's enough information out there for us to say, man, you'd be better off throwing, you know, mainly two seam fastballs. Okay. Uh, because you have low spin and a lot of th- I mean just educate you have to educate I think everybody yeah low spin is not bad it just means man you're really good down in the it's zone you're you're good. great arm side run and now what can we pair with that mm-hmm. and uh I do think uh when you're working with so right now I'm working with young players so it's like I'll just kind of show them like a face of a clock here's your arm at two o'clock and you told me you throw a, a slider and, but it's spinning up here toward 10 o'clock. So how could we make that better? You know, I try to put it in their court to yeah. help symbol the pitches. Well, I could get it to spin down more. Okay, so let's let's talk about that. And let's go out to a bullpen and we'll execute it. You know, at first we'll learn how to spin it. And then we'll try to get them in the strike zone. First, let's go out and spin. So, and I, I think uh, like assembling the... Uh, the arsenal. I mean, men are such visual learners. Well, know? yeah, I yeah, that's I what always... the the number code and the letter code for the shadow pitches yeah. work. And I think just being able to show someone, man, these like you said, you just showed me on your hand. Like these the pitches, they're all different. These like these are too close together. We've got yeah. to separate these. This change up in this fastball, the change up looks like a slow fastball. Yeah. You have no less vertical movement. And so let's try something different, you know, to make that more effective. Otherwise, the hitter is not fooled whatsoever. Yeah. I, I always go by the actual movement. Like a lot of times guys will use uh, induced vertical break, uh, which is nice to know. Right. But to me, to, to have an idea of how the pitch moved, if you only have induced vertical break, uh, then I have to know the velocity. Right, uh, but if you tell me the vertical break, I don't need to know velocity. I already know how the pitch is moving, and to know what kind of pitch it is and to know how it fits with other pitches, I just want to know how it moved in space. It went this way or it went that way, you know. So I, I mean, it's so it's so if you, uh, I mean, like like reading your stuff helped me so much. And it's like I'll tell you, we had a scrimmage game the other day, and I know this pitcher from his bullpens has 20 inch vertical, right? Mm-hmm. It's money and he's having trouble. It's like they're trying to call these pitches down and away. I told the catcher, hey man, so this is my sign. I want the fastball up, right? Huh? Fastball up, swing and miss. Same thing, fastball up. Add it, you know, next hitter. Catcher looks over. Call three pitches in a row. None of them are strikes. Swung and miss at all three of them. So it's like using what you have to make you better. So mm-hmm. this is the pitch you're gonna use. And if they stop stop swinging at that, that's okay. We'll get strike one. We'll learn a cutter or we'll learn a curveball. We can land early in the count. And then they're going to chase, they are going to chase that pitch. Mm-hmm. It's rare at this level to see that. I mean, that's a really good carry fastball up in the zone. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you like, you know, you use this stuff. And you're like, to me, that's how I would go back and use, uh, actually for him, I would have him throw the shadow top of the zone. Right. I'm going to stick all these fastballs. You better be on the top row or higher. That's where we're going to get these pitches. That's what we're going to practice executing. Do you use sometimes to say, okay, uh, I want you to hit this shadow zone at the top and then start your curveball there and let's see where it finishes. So you're going to start it at what number, what lettering is across the top? There's ABC. Well, uh, there's, uh, M and O P is up at the top. So start it at O and let's see where we fit. So that would be like to me a great visual for a pitcher too. Yeah. Like I start it here and let's see where we finish. And he goes, that was a good one. And I finished at the bottom of the zone. Perfect. Now let's see if I can't get one out of the zone. We'll start it a little bit lower, you know? I, I, I made up some uh, scripted bullpens for the target. I'd asked a number of friends uh, in pro ball, especially for what kind of, routines would you have a pitchers go through and one of the nice ones came from a, a a good friend where it was a fastball curveball combo like you said and i call it uh fastball 
curveball deception. And it shows you, it shows a picture of where I want the fastball. And then it shows it where I want the curveball. And he throws that one after another. Now, for him to throw that curveball at letter H, all right, he's got to start at O, it hits at H. And then the fastball he throws to O. But by by doing that over and over again, I'm making him funnel those two pitches. Right. So he's learning how to do funnel. Another one I do is a exception for, let's say, a, a cutter sinker. Uh, let's say you're, you're throwing a cutter sinker on the outside to a righty. I might want to go on the plate, off the plate, off, you know, back and forth, right. alternate. I'm going to, I'm trying to get on the edge of the bat, get weak contact or foul. So another thing with those combinations is what am I trying to accomplish with that combination? Am I trying to get a weak contact? Am I trying to get a foul or am I trying to get a strike? Uh, how do you think of pitches like that when you're commanding a pitch? or combinations, are you thinking about what's the outcome I'm trying to get? Um, I'm just going to execute the pitch, <laughs> you know. Uh, I had a pitcher a few years ago, Burke Badenhop, and he had pitched for Boston the year before, and he was right-handed pitcher, but a ton of arm side sinkers or uh, glove side sinkers, and he would get strike one. I mean, he had the highest take rate in the league on the first pitch. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it was like, okay, you got strike one. Now what? Because I see that they're kind of hitting you a little bit yeah. in these other situations, other counts. And he's like, man, I didn't, I didn't uh, think about that. You know, where do I go from here? Uh, so I think, you know, if, if I'm, you go to face a guy, have a plan, I'm going to pitch this guy. So I turned over the changeup, right? The, I throw it, you swing at it, out of the zone, I'm going to throw it again. Uh, so again, reacting to what you see, but you know, you practice so much, Wayne, it's like starting pitches in the zone to out of the zone. And if you could find something that goes, like you said, I can go, you know, uh, ball to strike pitches. But uh, I think those are like uh, great weapons. Uh, that we can get for the pitchers. And I think, man, if you, uh, I think having scripted bullpens and challenges and tracking things, I used to tell the pitchers with the Reds, man, I want to set your soul on fire. You know, I want you to think about pitching. I want you to be excited every day you come to the park and we're going to learn something new. I'm going to challenge you with something else. Uh, so, yeah, you know what's cool? I, is in the target, <clears throat> I put a thing that when you hit the spot <clears throat> that you intended to, it goes cha-ching. <clears throat> I've heard that. <laughs> it sounds like my Venmo account. I like it. Yeah, and guys love that. when they, And they go money and they start going, yeah, you know, like they really get pumped up. when they, Okay. I saw that. A uh, new sound that we're putting in, it's coming out in a few days, is when you miss your spot, it goes da 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 <laughs> okay and i like it man i think that gets guys excited for the challenge and uh you know it's a, it's a great idea for developing command uh in and out of the zone and like to me like learning how to funnel and challenging yourself yeah and sequencing and also for like uh like i said if you've got 10 pitchers and you want to give them work uh a lot of guys don't have time to kind of detail all the things for these guys but if you can say okay i want to do scripted bullpen number 11 they do it and then it gives you a report you see how he did on scripted 11 it shows you how many hit the spots how many didn't uh it shows you uh how many good misses he got it'll show you uh the location and direction of his misses so you can tell if you're missing with your slider uh, when I tell you to throw at number seven, you're always missing uh, to let up to the left. That's going to be a cue for you as a coach to say, okay, maybe there's some corrections we can make mechanically yep. or mentally where you're starting, you know? I, I mean, I think all that ties in, man. All these things make the pitchers better. Uh, that's a great tool and concept. And uh, I think just the ability that uh, you're educating the user and the coach, like I said, you know, he was 
a hundred percent on this arm side of the plate, but on this glove side, he was like, you know, we'll say one for 12. So that man, I need to really focus on that in the next practice session. Yeah. You yeah. Know, you may, so, may look at his stride foot where he's landing. You can just right. So it gives you, I mean, it gives you more purpose uh, in the, in your work time and your, for pitcher, for your bullpens, you know, even you can, I mean, to me, pitchers carry it to your flat ground the day you're not in the bullpen. Yeah. I mean, really work on that because yesterday and the day before I had trouble, you know, to the glove side of the plate. And it gives them accountability, meaning that, yeah. like you said earlier, they can't walk away from a bullpen saying, oh, I did great. You'll pick up the data and say, um, <laughs> yeah, you did. Or exactly. Yeah. You know? Well, Mac, I, I, I'm thrilled to have you on the show. I thank well, you. Man, so I appreciate it. it. I appreciate and, it. I enjoyed it. Uh, yeah, it was a good conversation. And uh, I'll talk to you later. All right, Wayne. Thank you so much. I appreciate Thanks. it. Bye-bye. Bye.